Okay, everybody, we're going to start up again on uh, selectivity. So Dan's giving the comment on uh, selectivity, and then we'll go into some discussions, and we'll have the diagnostic keynote at the end of the day. So thanks, Dan. Yeah. Good afternoon. My name is uh, Dan Fu. I'm working for the Indian Ocean Tuna Commission. Um, first, thanks for the opportunity to comment on um, Mark's talk on selectivity. Obviously, a uh, major aspects of um, stock assessment of any kind. Um, yeah, Mark has already has laid out um, quite a few points or, or topics. I guess each of them probably are research areas of its own own right. Uh, my comments are mostly supplementary. Um, probably just drawing a few examples of issues that you know I come across in the in our in our um, own assessments. Um, yeah, Mark's talk you know mentioned about the role of selectivity, you know, removing the fish at the right size or age, and you know fitting to the composition data, its influence on the MSY. Um, I guess first I just try to emphasize that um, it's probably well already well known that there's trade off between between those rows, you know, removing the fish at at right age or size generally requires that you use a more flexible selectivity. Um, in other words, if you know you're trying to estimate um, F at age or size better, um, then your selectivity become a nuisance parameter really. And on the other hand, if you try to get um, more information from your composition data, um, make inference about your population, then you tend to use more smooth or rigid selectivity. Um, this business of flexibility, flexible or, or smooth selectivity also have implications on the predictive power of your, of your, of your model, which become, can become important when it comes to projections. Um, selectivity affects MSY. I think most tuna RFMOs use um, F, uh, MSY base reference points one way or another. Um, you know, those, uh, the pattern of selectivity is usually change with, you know, the composition of the catch of different gears. Um, yeah, so I guess most tuna RFMOs will, these days, will sort of looking at dynamic um, MSY, um, you know, which is kind of a, a good practice. But just try to remind that, you know, in this kind of calculation, we normally just try to looking at um, some reference year to determine the average selectivity and, and calculating MSY, uh, which doesn't really give you a global MSY. The global MSY can only be determined by using, you know, knife edge selectivity at optimum age. Maybe interesting question why, you know, tuna RFMOs are not, I'm not aware of any tuna RFMOs that are using global MSY as a reference point. Um, maybe something to think about, I don't know. Um, Mark, I think, briefly mentioned about these uh, um, surplus production models that doesn't account for selectivity. I just try to remind colleagues some of the, you know, those Java, Java models that Henning Winkler developed, I think most people knows, um, that had a lot of applications with tuna or billfish fisheries. Um, that, you know, the recent development, the Java Select, it tends to um, take into account of fishing selectivities. So the model was able to, I think, there latest versions able to dis dis distinguish between exportable biomass and sporting biomass in the in the in the you know the biomass dynamics um yeah something to be aware of um defining fisheries um using tree regression or some other appropriate modeling approach uh it, it it's a good practice certainly we all agree um, but I just try to kind of back off a little bit here because for tuna fisheries, I think things are a bit more complicated, uh, at least for some RFMO, we're dealing with a lot of fleets, gears, countries, fisheries. I think this just not becoming, it's not just a modeling issue. A lot of this has to do with the fishery definition, has a lot to do with data reporting and, and management. If there's a lot of ambiguity in your, in your, in your gear and fishery definition in your, in your data, uh, reporting and management that's only going to um, affect the analysis of the data. So 
just maybe worth to draw people's attention to some of the work conducted by the FAO, you know, working party on fishery statistics. They did a lot of works to sort of harmonize the definition of fisheries, you know, combining concepts from you know, fishing effort domain, ideas from, you know, the catch domains um, when it comes to define fishing practice. I mean, IOTC, we is currently trying to kind of reviewing and standardize some of the fishery definition in our, um, you know, our data reporting and management. I understand this is kind of different concepts as what we do for stock assessment purposes when we come to define fishery or define fleets. It's, 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 a, it's a different idea. But obviously you can see there's some overlap or synergies can be drawn from the two um, streams of work. More clarity um, in the definition of gears or fisheries in, in the data reporting and management um, can only help analysis of the data for assessment a lot better, right? Um, on the age, the top, on the yeah, subject of age or lens selectivity, um, I guess it's safe to say um, most, or if not all of our tuna assessment are kind of age structured. I think it's important to um, be aware that you know how lens selectivity is implemented in an age structure model can be quite different between assessment packages. Most, I think, in all age structure models, the lens selectivity needs to be converted to age selectivity in a catch equation, right? So therefore, fish of the same age is going to have a same same f. Um, on the other hand, when it comes to fitting the composition data, a lot of cap uh, packages will apply the full lens selectivity to an age lens matrix to to kind of predict the size composition, the lens composition data. But not all assessment packages does that. So one of the, as example, one of the kind of problem encountered in some of my earlier, one of my earlier assessments, this is an age structure model. And you use, we actually use lens based selectivity, but you can't face to the, this, this very steep, um, you know, size distribution from, from the, the, the fisheries. So we really have to kind of have to switch to a size structure model in order to take fully utilize the size based, the, the lens selectivity. But not, not all the system packages has this problem. What I'm saying is that it's, I think it's important to be aware of how the assessment package is, is, is implementing the lens selectivity sometimes can make a difference. Um, when it comes to the choice between um, age or lens selectivity, I think general principles that Mark mentioned applies age based process, lens based process. Maybe it's safe to say some of the, you know, lens uh, gear driven um, processes like contact selectivity are relatively easy to identify, but you know selection by age is probably may not be that clear. You know whether fish, whether tuna are schooling by by age or by size, they move by age or size. It, it's I, I don't think there's any definitive uh, conclusion. But um, at the end of the day, assessment mostly considers population level selectivity, so it comes down to whether those things matters. Um, a lot of this discussion of age lens, age or lens selectivity was kind of happening in the context of time varying selectivity, right? If you selection is by lens, then it's not appropriate to use age selectivity if the growth varies. Um, one view is that if you do use time varying selectivity, it probably doesn't matter if you use age or, or, or lens selectivity. The actual practice varies a lot across RMOs. Some use lens, some use use age, and IOTC we use both. Um, this is some of our considerations. It's not best practice; it's just practice. Um, I just kind of list some of our considerations when it comes to choose age or lens selectivity. Um, the temporal structure of the model sometimes we take into consideration if the model is operating on sort of fine scale time step or fine scale age structure. Then we use age selectivity. If the model has a coarse, you know, time scale uh, annual model, then you use lens selectivity. So it really comes down to whether the age selectivity provides a good approximation of, of the lens selection. Lens selection. If it does, then it obviously makes a lot of sense just to use, uh, you know, age selectivity just for efficiency reasons. And quite often we kind of implementing, you know, models with different temporal structure. 
and we use different selectivity and we try to kind of compare compare them. I think that's kind of good practice to understand some of the pros and cons of different model structure and and you know the different different selectivities. Um, another consideration is that our assessment use a lot of tagging data we do in stock synthesis and stock synthesis the tagging data stratified by um, by age. So it, 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 a lot of time you find that you use age selectivity tends to fit the data better. Maybe you know it's kind of naturally facing how the data are structured. And when it comes to fitting the, the lens composition data, I think um, obviously if you're dealing with fishery with small fish or fishery with complex size structure, it makes sense to use um, lens, lens selectivity. Do need to caution this that the, the use of lens selectivity can sometimes um, mask some other problems in, in your model. This just comes down to that question that Jing raised a, a, a kind of a while ago, a, a couple of minutes ago. Um, basically, what we're showing here is, you know, the this is example taken from the from the our yellowfin assessment. You've got four fisheries, uh, fishery four. Um, five and six, we're looking at some fits to the lens composition data and fishery four and five um, use age selectivity and fishery six use lens selectivity. Obviously, there's problems in the fits of in fishery four and five, but fishery six seems to be fine. Looks like it's a selectivity problems. If you, for, for those two fishery, if you say switch to lens selectivity seems to go into solve the problem, but in the end tends out to be a gross problem. Um, the, the, the L1 parameter, which Alisa was talking about in the morning, that kind of um, is probably misspecified. Is probably misspecified in this case because our for yellowfin our growth come from the tagging data, which you know we really don't have information on on those initial size at age, which tends to sort of agreed by the working party, which kind of pick up a, a value for, for for those ages. It tends to cause that mismatch uh, here. Um, so when we kind of adjusting those values a bit, you find this problem goes away. Um, yeah, it's just an example of how sometimes it's not a, a, the problem is not because of the, 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 the choice of age or lens selectivity could be some other model misspecification. Well, fleet uh, as area approach, I think we dis discuss uh, a lot in the, in the, in the workshops. Uh, again, uh, this is spatial, spatial, uh, spatial models, and obviously practice varies again across our frameworks. Fleet as area is quite common. Spatially explicit model is also quite common. Um, in a lot of cases, it's, it's more, more of a combination of both. You use fleet as area within a spatial models. Now, when it comes to the selectivity problem, that the, 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 I did sort of want to talk about this when uh, the Matthew um, mentioned about this issue of sharing the selectivity of different different gear across a region i guess we have been enough discussion we probably know what the answer is now people have some sort of agreement what should be the right way to do but i do think um there are kind of um different views on this um yes or no depending on how much whether you want to take a lot of uh, signals population signals from 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 the data um, in IOTC, we in the past we tend to use shear selectivity for the same gear uh, across regions. I, I find it doesn't really matter that much if you you know the, if the size data are kind of quite similar across regions. It probably doesn't matter that much. But you do have cases where, for example, in this case, the big eye size data, average size in different regions, you clearly see there's some regional difference. Um, yeah, then in, in that case, if you share the selectivity, it's gonna cause some trouble in mode in a model fits um, that's one thing um, and also you don't really if you fix the selectivity if you share the selectivity you really don't get a lot of um, benefit by letting the data to inform movement and I think we discussed this another related issue is you know you know spatially model whether you should use asymptotic or dome shaped selectivity in each region um, of course there's a lot of papers and dis discussion around this topic, I, I guess the, the general view is that even though the fishery is operating on the entire region, but there's still going to be some um, spatial structure within the, the region, that means your selection is always going to be dome shaped. Um, 
so there's a lot of maybe um, I think the desire is always to try some use dome shape selectivity um, in, 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 in those cases. But I do think it's, it's worth to pay attention whether the model was creating cryptical biomass. I mean, this big eye example, we do use different um, selectivity in each region. Some of the regions, the uh, selectivity is kind of uh, dome shaped. Uh, we, we, we use dome shaped selectivity. And it does end up creating um, generating some kind of cryptical biomass, you know, the you know, kind of the difference between the total biomass as biomass vulnerable to the to, to fishing. And the level of crypt, cryptical biomass is obviously relates to the level of doming, and which again depends on, can be dependent on what kind of natural mortality you use, what kind of growth function you use. But I guess is I think this in terms of good practice, I think it's always good to watch out. If you do use dome shape, dome, dome selectivity, you should watch out whether um, there's issue with cryptical biomass and whether that needs to be addressed in your, in your sort of uncertainty um, and grid. Um, temporal variation, again, a big topic. I mean, tuna fishery generally deal with long time series of lens composition data. So there's always going to be a lot of variability in the time series. All the factors that leads to, you know, time variance selectivity always going to apply or occur for the tuna fishery. You know, the regional variation in subpopulations, the difference in the gear selection within the same fleets, combined with the changes in fishing effort, etc. And uh, you know, for tuna, for the person fishery, they catch you know different different type of school juvenile versus adults. So there's a lot of variation. And uh, sometimes they catch in the same cohort over time, creating really some nasty patterns in your size composition data. But I do think when it comes to use time varying selectivity, you do have to, I think it's important to understand what are the driving causes, what are the underlying causes for some of those patterns variability you see in, in, in the size data. I think time varying selectivity is not something should be used automatically. And um, as example here, we have this uh, long line average size for the yellowfin. This is what's been used in the yellowfin assessment in 2018. The gray dots are the other observed values. And you can see um, there are obviously some strong patterns or trend in each region. So they're actually quite similar, consistent across region. You've got this initial large decline. Um, a lot of uh, small fish in the middle part of the time series, a lot of large fish end of the time series. Obviously, the model, the, the, the red dots are the model fitted values. If you use stationary selectivity, the model can't fit, it, fit to it. But instead of using time variance selectivity, we IOTC kind of conduct a lot of pro size data review projects try to understand what are the reasons, even though there's still a lot of uncertainties on some of the, the patterns, you know, the initial decline, whether that's due to decline in the population size or, or changes catch, or, or due to the changes of catchability because, you know, the fishing was, ex, was expanding in the early part of the fisheries, or it's due to the data reporting and management issues that Sato Sun was mentioned before. And the middle time, the middle part of the time series, we have, we kind of pretty sure it's due to the biased sampling. Those data shouldn't be used in, in the model. The later part of the time series, the large fish are mostly come from, you know, uh, a, a large complex, a mix of other fleets. That's probably due to spatial variabilities in, in the samples because they're from different locations. But it could also due to those large fish could also due to the changes in growth. The reason we say that because we also see evidence of those large fish occurring in some of the other fleets, other fishery as well. So yeah, so it's not it's not a simple solution just to use a time varying selectivity on those cases. For person catches, again, a different scenario, different stories. We have, you know, those multi modes um, distribution in our person and size distribution. It's pretty common in, in more oceans, but in IOTC, these type of patterns are very pronounced. Um, we, put, we normally use uh, 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 spline selectivity to feed the, 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 those type of size data, but it doesn't really deal with uh, the, the problem of, of varying, you know, proportion of small versus large fish problems. So in the end, we, we are more leaning towards uh, in recent assessment just to treating the separate components of the size distribution as separate fisheries, you, 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 we end up splitting the catch, splitting the size, size distribution outside of the model and fitting separate um, independent um, selectivity to them. 
maybe a better approach is to use some kind of composite um, selectivity. Um, it's similar idea. You just use different sort of uh, selectivity to different, um, sorry, different components of a size distribution, but those selectivity are kind of linked together through shared uh, parameters. So it's kind of more structured way of dealing the same problems, but probably more biological meaningful. Um, but again, even you looking at those data in each, each component separately, those are the, just for the small fish, you still see a lot of nasty structure in the size distribution, right? We, we, you can see that for those small fish, we see we, there's kind of multiple cohorts in the size, size, size data. Sometimes you've got these single cohorts and moving through time. So these are kind of things that are very difficult to deal with through, I think, a time varying selectivity. Um, just two more slides, just briefly mentioned about this business of standardization of catch composition data. Um, Mark talked about this tree regression used to um, define the fishery and fleets, but you can use tree regression. Once you define the fleets, you use the tree regression sort of to post stratify your catch samples and kind of then you kind of scale them to mitigate um, the bias. It's, it's pretty common use approach. So I think people need to <laughs> just try to remind people, you know, those kind of distinctions. And there's also model based approach to, um, as I was mentioned the other day, Phil um, never did develop these uh, methods quite a bit. And, you know, those model based approach use the racially multinomial to account for variability in spatial strata. You kind of apply them to the yellowfin or yellowfin data, which works quite well. There has been some recent development of that method as well by, by, um, by Phil. Um, the final point was um, on this topic of selectivity estimation just wants to emphasize that it's not just the composition data affects the selectivity estimates for the tuna assessment, you know, especially those include tagging data, the tagging returns can be conflicting with your catch, catch uh, comp can be conflicting with your size composition data, which cause, can cause bias in your selectivity estimates. Another issue is that you know, we have recently seen a lot of development of those catch independent, independent abundance indices from the person fisheries, you know, those echo buoyant abundance indices. There's also this uh, abundance is based on the associated behavior of fish um, with those floating objects. I mean, those indices have already been, a lot of application of those indices being used in the actual assessment. But I haven't really seen much of a research on how the selectivity for those uh, indices are derived. Maybe it's some, some issues that needs to be thought about. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. Uh, any comments? Yeah, Dan. Uh, thanks, Dan. That was great. Um, I just wanted to emphasize one of your um, opening slides there. That's kind of an aside to selectivity, but the idea of global MSY, um, I think that's a really useful tool. Um, I did a paper a couple of years ago um, comparing conditional MSY and global MSY, and I think Mark had one before I even knew what MSY was. That was probably better, but um, when you start comparing the biomass at MSY between the global and the conditional, you see some really eye-opening differences um, between those biomass levels. And so I think it's a really useful diagnostic tool for management purposes, I think, um, to let people know how suboptimally we're kind of harvesting a lot of these species. And so I think it's in stock synthesis now is something that you can kind of turn on and off just to see what it looks like. But I do think it's a useful comparison, not only the MSY, because you can't really get the MSY from you know the global MSY, um, but you could technically get the biomass associated with the global MSY if you wanted to use that as a target. Um, I'm not saying that we should do that, especially for all species, but you know, it's a useful seeing the difference between what the MSY is based on your current selectivity patterns and comparing that to what it could be um, based on the global MSY, I think is a very useful one that I'd like to kind of see people use a little more often, I think. Yeah, thanks for the comment. Um, yeah, this, this kind of issue was uh, mentioned to me by Rick Messel. He was kind of helping me bring some of the ideas, he was mentioning this to me. So I kind of have a look at, look upon, you know, he was telling me that, as you said, the stock synthesis speeds out those global MSY values. I did have a look at for, at least for the yellow thing. I actually find they are actually not much different. I was a bit surprised to see what was uh, estimated by just using average selectivity pattern. 
maybe that's kind of species dependent, as you say, you see examples where they're quite different. Um, but yeah, but in my case, I think probably people are aware of this, right? You, 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 the yield crude analysis kind of using the, the knife edge selectivity should give you the optimum yield. I think those kind of, but I was just surprised to see um, there has been no discussions on um, the tuna RFMO in terms of, you know, using that as a reference point, maybe for practical reasons. But I mean, IOTC, because um, recent years there has been a lot of discussion. There's a lot of tensions on the, you know, the person fishery because they catch juvenile fish. So there's a lot of push to doing those kind of yield analysis and fish impact analysis. I think we just had some project going to do this type of analysis. Maybe that's something can be sort of brought up. Yeah, well, one thing that we did was we did MSY by gear for a long time. <laughs> and people just ignored it. So after like five years, we gave up doing it. <laughs> um, but yeah, may, maybe now of MSC certification and things like that, it might actually be more important so people might start caring about okay. these particular things. Yeah. Um, any questions or comments? Yeah. Uh, thanks, Dan. Um, just curious, uh, I think you mentioned Java Select, and um, as far as I know, uh, Java Select still uses some kind of age aggregated production function, uh, which is like matched with some kind of age structure equilibrium model. So I guess it still uh, cannot fully incorporate um, the impact of demographic changes on the, on the productivity of the stock. So uh, I'm just wondering, what do you think the, the benefits of using Java Select over like age structure production model? Right? Um, I don't know a lot of detail about Java Select. I don't know if Henning is online can help out, maybe not. Uh, but I, I think still Java Java model is is the one that most widely used for the tuna and billfish applications. And I'm probably wrong, but one of the uh, I think maybe intentions for for them to develop Java Select because when they apply this to the Java model to the shark fishery, to the shark species, there's kind of a delay in the dynamics because they tend to catch a lot of juvenile sharks and uh, but then uh, the shark kind of mature like 10 or 20 years later. So there's a big gap in these dynamics that really screw up with, uh, with the predictions. So I think maybe that's one of the drive they, they develop the, the, the Java select. And also they use kind of the life history parameters approach the kind of to anchor the shape of your product, production cur curve. So it's kind of looks be more like your, the production curve from your age structure model with different, different steepness. Um, yes, uh, uh, yes, as you said, it's still a, 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 it's still a biomass aggregated model. So it's, I think it's just trying to, there are a lot of work they're doing, it's just trying to, to make it uh, behave more like an age structure model. Yeah, hi, Kun. Thank, thank you for the presentation. Just a quick question on L, L1. So uh, you mentioned that it was 30 before and there was a misfit. So could you briefly explain uh, how you guys decide to change it to 20? Like uh, it estimated inside the model or estimated externally? Um, this, this fix was not identified in the assessment. This is something identified during the um, Yellowfin review workshop happened a couple of weeks ago. Um, with the help of Mark and a few of his a few colleagues. Um, so this is kind of something we tried. We, even we, we looks like we changed to a value of 20 that looks like solve the problem, but it actually may not because we're here, we're still looking at the aggregated fits, right? We're looking, if you're looking at those things by, 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 by quarter, by year, there's still a lot of nasty patterns. It's still, it's, we, we haven't got a very satisfactory solution. I'm just using this example of, you know, how things, you know, things like growth can be related to the choice of uh, select, selectivity. Um, we haven't really de de decided what would be the value to use, um, whether you should try to estimate in the model. We actually, in the workshop, we try to estimate this parameter in the model. We thought it's gonna be working well, but then it, it doesn't. And you heard uh, Lisa this morning was talking about some issues if you try to estimate this parameter in the model. Yeah, any 
questions on this growth? No, okay. No one else? Okay, Simon, yeah? Yeah, Dan, could you switch to the figure where you've got the the whole time series of, of length estimates, comparisons, um, later on, where you've got them going from year there, and you're talking about the that early decline in size from 1950 through to about 1960. Um, I mean, one possible explanation for that is the stupid fish hypothesis, where you have it's a behavioural issue where you have old fish or bold fish, but you don't have any old bold fish because later on, early on, you're catching a bunch of old fish that are inexperienced, but later on, they're all fished out, and you only catch the you tend to catch the smaller fish after. A little while as fish get experienced with long liners, etc. So, I've just that's a, that's a hypothesis. I just wondered if anybody has experience with a fishery where there's evidence for that and where it's been demonstrated that that can happen. I guess not. Oh. Then, yeah. When we first no, I can't answer that question. But when we first saw this pattern, you know, we saw CPE pattern show this kind of large decline as well. We saw that at least this kind of a consistent. But in the end, you know, those both decline, whether CPE or the decline in the size data is not kind of conform with uh, you know the dynamics in the model because catch in the early years was so generally so small. So it's probably not a population signal anyway. Well, yeah, it's not a that's right it's not a if it's explainable by the model then it implies continuous selectivity sure. but if it's if it's the stupid fish hypothesis then it would ex wouldn't be yes. explained by the model and yeah. so that is consistent with that hypothesis okay. and yeah one of the things i did is i looked where it was happening and as you went as the fishery went further west through time the fish size change progressed further west with the fishery. It's, it, it happened shortly after the arrival of the fleet in the area. Um, so it wasn't a sampling issue. Anyway. Okay. Um, I guess I'd like to go back to the surplus production model thing. <laughs> Everyone knows my view on surplus production models, but actually I'm going to defend it a little bit. So um, Kai's presentation, he had density dependent growth and we don't model density dependent growth in our stock assessments. And it might be confounded with density dependent recruitment, things like that. So you may not be able to estimate, estimate it. So one argument for using a surplus production model is that you may not know what the density dependent processes are and there might be multiple ones so you want to aggregate it into one function i'm not particularly a proponent of that but particularly for tuners where you have small fish and large fish being caught by different fisheries but that's one thing worth considering in our assessment models is the density dependent growth and you know whether we should be modeling that and whether you know some more general form of density dependence is worth thinking about at least in um, maybe in uh, MSE type um, harvest control rules. Okay, any comments or questions? Jimmy and Ella, you had a comment online. Do you want to expand on that a bit? I could. Can you hear me? <laughs> yeah, we can hear you, Jim. Well, yeah, thanks, Dan, for the, the presentation and, and the discussion. I thought it was really interesting. Um, yeah, the comment before was, I think Dan really highlighted what what the concern I had was. Um, and I don't think it's a length. It was more your assertion, Mark, that you said that length-based selectivity would solve the solve this problem. And clearly that doesn't seem to have been the case. It was a growth problem, which is exactly my suspicion. And I do think in lots of synthesis applications, people try to estimate L1 and the variance terms for these. Um, 
and it, it, it can cause some problems, especially with like base selectivity. Um, yeah, that that's all I had on that that bit. Yeah, so so I kind of agree. Um, this is kind of a relevant example is that one of my first assessments was snapper here in New Zealand in the Haraki Gulf. Um, I'm not sure if it's an assessment or just a research analysis, but there was time varying growth for the very smallest fish. And so if you have a constant selectivity, those fish would go either be too small or large. And so that would have a big impact on the estimated recruitment, because if you if they were small, your average selectivity was low for that. So that means that the model said there must be millions and millions of them. And so for the historical recruitments, it wasn't so bad because you see those multiple times as they come through and are fully selected by the fishery. But in the most recent years, if there is some variability in recruitment, you can get a huge cohort coming through. So you predict, you know, you do a projection, you say, oh, the population is going to go up, let's triple the quota. And then, of course, it was just growth and the quota shouldn't have been that high and you get in trouble probably. Um, any other comments or questions? We can move on to any questions for Dan or myself or, yeah. or discussions. I, yeah. I do I, I do have a general one since um, I, I was a little intrigued by your um, interest in uh, promoting double normal time bearing selectivity. Um, is there some new new evidence that that seems to work better? I just I didn't quite get why why um, you were yeah. favoring that today. Well, yeah, <laughs> maybe tomorrow it'll be different. Yes. Um, so so the idea is that in general, if you've got a sort of a regular fishery fishing on um, different species, or I mean, uh, sorry, on the you know on a stock or something like that, that you would expect the the fish that you see to be sort of a re regular size, at least on average, you wouldn't expect to see a really weird distribution where you were catching small fish one year and big fish the next year. And so if you did have something like that, it's probably because the fishermen's behavior have changed. So they fished in different areas or they are fishing deeper or they changed their targeting or something like that. So you should be able to somehow split out those different fisheries so if you think about it in that way you should really be trying to get a link frequency distribution and the associated selectivity be to be fairly regular looking and so a double normal is pretty regular a normal is symmetric so you wouldn't want to use that but a double normal seems to be reasonable so that was the sort of the theory behind that is if you can split out the fisheries well enough, then the remaining selectivity should be all fairly double normal looking, or at least all logistic, you know, anywhere in, in there. That was the idea. Well, thanks. Yeah, yeah Carolina. Um, I would like to highlight uh, a new idea that came out uh, from the from ijima san in um, the albacore working group he the, and colleagues were able to split the fisheries occurring in, at the same place by the bimodal pattern um, using the uh, average weight i think i mentioned that in the other meeting the so the weight of the um, catch in the set divided by the number of fish in the set and so he was able to split two fisheries and have for each one of them um, like a double, double normal selectivity. But it, it was something really peculiar for that species because uh, we have an areas of split model that is trying to approximate movement. And so movement going back and forth of two different ages at the same time. And it seems that different sets will catch different uh, ages uh, or end sizes therefore but it's very very pe peculiar way to to address the problem and we will need more refined data more fine scale data to do that yeah thanks carolina so that brings up the point with dan and then your notion with the unassociated fisheries with small and large fish too 
so it would be nice to be able to have some explanatory variable for that i mean you, you did it just simply by splitting them up but instead of by aggregated but actually set by set right um is that something dan you, you guys could do um we haven't done that it would be good to have some methods to as carolina was mentioning to have a good way of splitting them because at the moment we really just did this hard way because we you know this problem exists for for a long time we just haven't really thought about how to deal with it you know those variable proportions and you have a constant selectivity that can't can, can deal with it um well, we know that you know those two types of fish are not caught by the same sets that generally you know the free free screw they're different type of free screw and depends on but for the yellow thing so it's really should be um we had a lot of argument that in the working group groups that those two separate type of school should be really treated as separate fishery that's why we kind of try to do it that way but because the way we divided it there's a lot of kind of kind of split in the middle so there's a lot of edge effects and uh, you know you get a very weird distributions which kind of we're not even though we solve this variable proportion problem but we're not really improved the uh, Leads to the data. Yeah, Carolina. Question: Ed, What kind of data do you have for the set? Do you have length frequencies or uh, um, any proportion of size or any other? In our no, I think this we only have the the data I'm working with is just size frequency data. But in terms of what the data, the percent data available, I think I need to consult with my. My, my colleagues, um, I think they do collect a lot of data and it's quite actually quite accessible, even if we don't have it in our in our database, I think we can quite easily request them to assist this type of analysis. Yeah, something like commercial categories or our observer type program with small, medium and large might actually be able to differentiate those sets. Yeah. Okay. In yeah, for good as well. Yeah, thanks uh, for your presentation. Uh, as uh, Dan -san showed, uh, in the size frequency data, uh, sometimes uh, there are same same cohort over several years. And uh, I think uh, we saw those uh, this kind of composition data in the uh, stock assessment openly. And uh, uh, yeah, we uh, try to come up with those uh, data uh, by changing the selectivity over time, temporary or something, uh, those things. Uh, however, uh, for the uh, future projection, uh, we assume a constant selectivity over time in many cases, I think. Uh, is this still the, uh, one of the good practice uh, for the se uh, selectivity assumption for future projection? Uh, I think that's uh, maybe a slightly different uh, topic in terms of, you know, when you have a time varying selectivity, how you deal with that in projection probably a slightly different topic but i agree with you here you know when you see this cohort moving through time we see that a lot in the percent fishery i think the percent fishery is um it's it's kind of quite not that easy to deal with it's really it's a very non-selective method right it really depends on a lot of it just measure availability of the fish right so the, you know the percent net itself is not that selective it depends on what the fish were, were there you know we create all sorts of patterns, but if we're only dealing with, if we always see the same kind of pattern, the cohort moving through, then maybe it's easy to deal with, but that's not just the, 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 the we're not just only see that sort of pattern, we also see multiple cohorts um, in the fishery as well. Um, so there are a lot of changes in the size structure data. What I was trying to emphasize there is very difficult to deal with just this kind of size data with, uh, with uh, you know, uh, time varying selectivity. Um, I'm not sure what the solution is, maybe it needs to screen in the data a bit more. And another thing is, uh, we don't know whether those data are representative of the catch or not, um, whether that's partly due to sampling, it's, it's all the problem are confounded. Thanks, Dad. Yeah, Haikun. Uh, just 
quick comment on the uh, selectivity for the projection period. So for stock synthesis, you will use the uh, 2D air selectivity deviates. The uh, normally can be propagated in the projection period. You specify a correlation across age and across time, or across length and across time. So it won't be it won't go to the mean for the projection period. So that signal can be propagated into the projection period. Thanks. So um, Fukuda brought up a good question: cohort targeting, and we see that. In some fisheries, I think Jimmy and Nelly, I think he's looked into it before, so I assume it's in Pollock, it's in bluefin tuna, and um, probably in some others. So, has anyone um, implemented cohort targeting type selectivity um, in their tuna assessments or other assessments? And, and how frequent do people think the cohort targeting occurs in, in tuna fisheries? Yeah, Fukuda san. Yeah, our uh, recent finding is uh, 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 when we, we observed a uh, uh, very abundant uh, recruitment cohort, uh, that uh, cohort uh, uh, suffered to the very high fish mortality at the young age because the fishermen can easily find the uh, school or some yeah, uh, fish uh, that cohort. And uh, that cohort are continuously caught by same fleet over several years. Uh, yeah, we they observe uh, by data as well as assessment results. Do if there's a high abundance of young tuna, not necessarily bluefin, but any tuna, does that mean that that yeah? But I'm, I'm talking in general. Does that mean that the school sizes are bigger, or there's just more school sizes? Because if the school sizes are bigger, they'll be easier to see probably, and then you're more likely to target them. But if there's just more school sizes, more schools, it wouldn't make much difference unless they aggregated locally, then so it was easier to find the place where there was schools. I don't know. Good question for the biologists. Um, Jimmy and Nelly. Have you got any opinions on cohort targeting and how to model it? Yeah, um, thanks for the deflection. Um, at, at one of the CAPA meetings, I, I presented a, what, what they called, it was basically a, a Russian study that they called it triple separability. So it's by age, year, and cohort. And um, ironically, we're having a paper come out pretty soon that um, is making it more general and in TMB, um, just just which is it can be broadly applicable for problems related to weighted age, or um, within an assessment model where you can basically estimate the covariance uh, of the covariance parameters across cohort age or, or year, and um, yeah be a random effect, you can say whether, oh, there's no indication that there's targeting and it, it could apply to a selectivity function. Um, all the smart stuff was done by the other Jim, of course, Jim Thorson. Um, but yeah, we, we've, we've applied it. Um, just on the, on the problem of Dan's, Dan Fu's um, bimodal, you know, small fish and then big fish, you know, I don't know if it's worth talking about but you know i'm sure there's a way you can configure stock synthesis and haikun probably just had a really good way of dealing with that type of variability but it, it's also something that you know in a, a that could be pretty easily specified uh in code you know it's just make it so that you split the model so that the fish younger than 50 centimeters or whatever um are treated separately than the fish that are bigger than that and and then you don't have to worry so much about weird shape selectivity and and but I I gather in this you're not trying to estimate year class strength with those data you're just make trying to make sure that you get the removals correct and so in that case I think it's really important to have a lot of flexibility um, just to get those fish removed and 
Dan's last point on the, we don't know if the catches are representative. Well, yeah, that's a big problem. If that's, if they're not representative, then there's other problems. Yeah. So Jim, just to follow up on your, the approach you were suggesting for Dan, I'm not sure if I fully understood it, but I th think a reasonable approach, which I think you might have been saying was that rather than fitting splitting the link frequencies and fitting them separate, you actually have two fisheries in the model. You have one that is um, small fish and one that is big fish, and they have a selectivity, and you estimate the 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 selectivity. I mean, the link frequency caught for those two fisheries, and then you add them together, and then you fit. Yeah. To the, then you fit to the combined distribution, so you're fitting to what you see, but you've got different components making it up, and so then where they overlap, it won't be just a a complete break it'll follow the the double normal distribution that you use to uh, define the selectivity it, that that sounds like a possibility um that that isn't what i was thinking of but it sounds like also a really hard problem to be able to split the data up and feel good about it <laughs> um and, and i was thinking of something more simple that you would say these young fish get treated differently in the selectivity form and it's like can annually vary a lot so basically you're fitting those data perfectly you're because the thought is you're not trying to get any information other than that they were caught um yeah that, that's all i was trying to get get to okay we've got a few more minutes for discussion uh any other topics yeah simon I get a, a suggestion, I guess, which might be a good practice, which is um, assuming that long line selectivity is seasonal, um, because you look at most of the mostly you look at the long line size data, you do see seasonal patterns, and if you don't define it as seasonal, um, then it's a source of misspecification because um, you always get some lack of fit, uh, and by assuming that it's seasonal and you have separate selectivities you get more information out of the data you do have to estimate more parameters but i think you're actually getting a lot more information by reducing the misspecification um, the problem is that you have a lot more fisheries to manage um, if you've like if you've got a, a like a pseudo year um, kind of structure um, that can be quite hard to manage but that's just an overhead that you can handle using the right kind of r code um, so yeah, just want, wondered what people thought about that. Yes, I think that's I think that's along the same line of you know if you see regional difference of right you see seasonal difference in, in the long side you know, selectivity. So, but associated with that is you have to split the indices as well. So you, yeah, that's just a lot of overhead in terms of. Um, I think that's a reasonable thing to do. It's just, uh, as you said, there's more data and fisheries to manage inside your model, that's all. Yeah, so related to that, one thing is if you did the um, regression tree analysis, you would maybe detect whether there was a seasonal pattern in link frequency. So that would be one thing to try. But you also have to be careful about how to model this. Is it movement or is it selectivity? And if it's movement, are you using a spatial model or areas as fleets models? And so that would depend on how you would break up the selectivity in the CPOE and seasonal and stuff, but definitely seasonality is worth looking at. Either way, you probably have to deal with it if there is pattern. Okay, any other questions, comments? Um, oh yeah, we got Matt Vincent's got a question, right? Yeah, I was gonna ask if anyone has a conceptual model for why we see a lot of really small fish, like uh, the forty to sixty range in the per sane, and then they kind of disappear in like the intermediate sizes, and then they show up again in the larger sizes, and. 
I'm curious if anyone has, yeah, some sort of conceptual model that, or behavioral explanation for why this occurs in the fishery. We, we actually discussed that with exactly the same question, exactly the same question in the Yellowfin Review Workshop. And we tried to look searching for those missing, you know, middle size range fish. And we did find them in the, in the uh, uh, I think the Gearnet fishery in the Arabian Sea region. But that's, 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 that's a joke, but we do see some middle range fish in some of the other parts of the ocean, but that doesn't mean, you know, that's a, that's a fish kind of escaped the percent fisheries. Yeah, I think one, one theory that came up was that they school as juveniles for protection and when they come larger, they don't need it anymore, but then they school again as adults for spawning or something. And so it might just be schooling behavior that's doing it. And so you school for different reasons. So it's different sizes, but yeah, we just made that up. So who knows how <laughs> true that is. Okay, no one else seems to have an explanation, so we'll, we'll say that's truth. Um, hi, Kun. I wanted to ask a question about your time varying selectivity. So it's age and, what is it? No, yeah, age and time. Would it possibly, could, could you possibly put cohort in there as well? Uh, it's age or length and time. It could be length as well. Yeah, no, but I mean, you've got yeah. a two, you've got two dimensions, yeah. age and time or length mm -hmm. and time, right? Mm -hmm. Could you, you make it three dimensions and put cohort as well? Uh, yeah, as uh, Jim Ian and Ali mentioned, Jim Thorson is, has, has a paper in review, and if that, that method uh, works well, that can be incorporated in stock synthesis, but it's in ADMB, but, but it should, theoretically work. Yeah. Okay, I think we're done selectivity for now. Um, so I think we'll move on to the next topic. So we're going to move on to diagnostics. And Felipe is going to give the keynote. And that will be the last presentation for the day. And then we'll pick up again with selectivity in the morning with Jimmy and Ali as a commenter, and then have the discussion. So Felipe, are you online and can you share your screen? Yeah, um, hello everyone. Hey Mark, I'm online, can you see me? Yeah, we can see you and we can hear you, yep. Awesome. Okay, can you share your okay. screen so we can check yep. that out? One second. Okay, we can see your screen, but it's not in full screen mode yet. Yep, that's good. good. Enough? Yep, perfect. Awesome, perfect. <clears throat> okay, um, aloha. Thank you very much, Mark and Simon, and for organizing this workshop and um, and for everyone that um, staying late. So again, I am Felipe Carvalho. I am speaking to you from Honolulu, Hawaii. I'm a stock assessment scientist at the NOAA Pacific Islands Fisher Science Center. And um, thank you, Mark, for the invitation. And although I'm presenting, the information in the next slides is a product of many collaborators, and it's an exciting example of international scientific uh, teamwork. So what I will present today highlights diagnostic tools that can assist analysts in identifying problems with model misspecifications. My intent in giving this presentation is first 
to provide reasoning on why we should consider applying model diagnostic, diagnostics throughout our tuna assessment. Um, and I will also provide a brief review on the implementation and interpretation of some current model diagnostic tools and where do diagnostics apply in a, an ensemble. I will also highlight some recent, recent innovations developed to help the application and improvement of model diagnostics in what steps fishers organi organizations, specifically tuna RFMOs, are taking to encourage the application of diagnostics on their routine assessments. Okay, so let's do this first. Why apply model diagnostics? Well, as we know, model misspecification is inevitable and is a result of incorrect, often simplifying assumptions. Sometimes of model some types of model misspecification include incorrect specification of a model parameter, including wrong values for fixed parameters, etc. Using incorrect model structure, as we saw in previous talks, for example, the shape of the selectivity curve. Incorrect specification of the likelihood functions, such as the size of the variance parameter. Incorrect specification of the observation model. The system dynamic model, for example, unmodeled temporal, vari temporal variation in biological processes. And the last but not least, ignoring process variability. Model misspecification can lead to a major issue, data conflict, as we all heard a lot about, which is when two or more data sets given the model structure provide information about a model state or processes that disagree. For a while, we thought that the solution to data conflicts often was to eliminate one of the data conflicting data sources or downweighting, but we really don't do that in our assessments much anymore. We don't throw, we don't simply throw data out, which this section is represented, represented here in, the, in your screen by the green circle in the diagram. Nearly Equivalently, reduce the weight of the data components when fitting the model is dealing with the systems rather than underlying cause of the data conflicts, represented here by the purple circle in the diagram. So what we have left in the middle is diagnostics. Tools for diagnose poor fits to the data and determine which data sources are in conflict can be used as a very starting point place to identify model misspecification. Several diagnostics have been evaluated for their utility to identify data conflicts within integrated assessment models, commonly used for, for doing assessments. And in reality, diagnostics is our third option to deal with symptoms from model misspecification here represented in the yellow circle. Such model diagnostics range from graphical visualization and basic goodness of statistics to computationally intense techniques that can involve iterative refitting and profiling. To better understand how can diagnostics assist, assist the analyst dealing with model misspecification, a number of studies have been published, especially in the last two years, providing guidelines for implementation and interpretation of um, commonly used and new developed um, diagnostics. We can also link the development of model diagnostics to build confidence or even to provide some sort of validation to the models that we put forward. By applying and communicating results from diagnostics, we could, for example, build confidence to people not directly in the model construction process understanding that the model diagnostics could play an important role to establish a base model or an ensemble of candidate models, it's a crucial step that needs to be fully embraced by the tuna, tuna stock assessment community. Although a lot of you attending this workshop um, routinely apply model diagnostics on your stock assessments, for those that um, don't do it, I would like to provide a very brief overview of some of the um, commonly applied diagnostics that we consider crucial to assist during the model development. So 
So in the real world, how do we interpret and use diagnostic results? We group the diagnostics into four categories. First, goodness of fit. Are the residuals sufficiently random? The second group of diagnostics are related to the information source and structure of the model. Diagnostics is this category, diagnostics in this category would assist the analyst to identify signs of data conflict, presence of the production function and evidence of retrospective patterns. Providing fisheries management advice requires predicting a stock's response to management and checking that the predictions are consistent with future reality. And that brings us to the third group of the diagnostics. In this group, the proposed diagnostics were designed to measure the accuracy or forecasted value to the actual observed value that is not known by the model. The fourth group addressed the overall model convergence. There, we included diagnostics to check if the model has converged to a global solution, if the hashing is positive, definite, and also if there are highly correlated parameters or with excessively higher uh, high variance. An additional component in the diagnostic process that we have been seeing um, quite often recently is the evaluation of the model plausibility. We don't provide, and at, at least at this point, I don't know any specific test for that, but instead we recommend checking the model plausibility by evaluating the diagnostics results altogether in context. Interestingly, plausibility is a term often used, but um, seldom defined in stock assessment. Plausibility may be estimated formally based on a statistical approach or specified based on expert judgment. Here, we will put plausibility in the model diagnostic context, such as using the results from the four diagnostic properties as objective criteria for evaluating the plausibility of a model. In addition, stock specific plausibility criteria should be considered to when an analyst evaluate if the assessment results are consistent with the prior knowledge about the exploitation history and population biology which can come from expert opinion, for example. These diagnostics I just mentioned, most of them are not new. Uh, they've been in, in, in our field for a while. However, their use got read and uptake after they were incorporated into a generic process of model development in which was first introduced by Mark Maunder and Kevin Piner in their paper in Fisher's research in 2017. And that was really the motivation for us to start the cookbook, the, public, the publication in 2021. We look at Mark's and Kevin's work and, and, and how the diagnostics all uh, played together. So in 2021, we provided a new flow that incorporated other diagnostics, uh, such as the hind casting in retrospective analysis. But we proposed, but, but really we proposed what highlights a very iterative process. In general, the process flows from, and this is the, the, the figure on the right hand inside, the process flows from top to bottom and shows when a diagnostic test is recommended. The flow chart includes several detour options to consider when a model diagnostics do not show satisfactory results. Um, in the process, we interpret a detour as a model exploration step that might not necessarily lead to changes, but typically includes some additional analysis to help justify modeling decisions. As expected, um, the proposed flow, the proposed flow was already reviewed um, based on discussions on previous workshops that happened last year. Um, and we found, for example, that the AG structure production model um, diagnostic um, here on the green box uh, serves primarily to understand model behavior instead of being considered as a 
full on diagnostics. So for example, we revise the flow and maybe the ASPM we recommend they use to understand model behavior, but maybe should not be considered as a full on diagnostics to, to be included in the, in the overall flow in model development. So again, finally this year, um, in the last two months, after two years of the publication of the cookbook, we have been looking more and more into the trade-offs of applying all these diagnostics in conjunction, as their ele elements are really not really um, independent. So we upgraded the flow again in a different context, and as it became clear that when we push hard to fix issues, for example, to fit, to improve the fit to the data, it may impact the results of other diagnostics. So it's, it, it's, really, it's really difficult to maintain um, that balance. And we really need to start analyzing the trade-offs. More specifically, for example, when you have too many parameters, you run out of degrees of freedom and the prediction skills goes down. So you try to fix one issue and then you end up um, causing another diagnostic to fail or to uh, provide um, not reasonable results. So from a trade-off perspective, the plausibility comes in really liking all the elements. So is there a convergence? And are your trade-off well-balanced among all the four diagnostic groups? Um, and finally, always check um, if your model is consistent with prior knowledge about exploitation history and population biology. But as you can see in this figure here, it still maintain those five main groups that we, we believe are key for our assessment, convergence, goodness of fit, model consistency, prediction skill, and of course, plausibility. While preparing for this presentation, I did a bit of great literature review um, for stock assessments developed in the last two years, mainly for some of the RFMOs. And the uptake of diagnostics implementation is quite impressive. Um, even in stock assessments with mixed assessment models like stock synthesis and Java and Java Select, you really can see how it's becoming more and more common to report diagnostic results in our assessments. Even when you compare um, a, a benchmark in 2022 to the, uh, the same species benchmark three years later, you pretty much added 10, 15 pages of diagnostic results to the assessment report. And that's quite impressive um, and encouraging. So here's a list of the 10 assessment reports that I looked specifically to find patterns in the, the use in model diagnostics. They are from the Pacific, Atlantic, and Indian Ocean tuna and gillfish species. Some of this work also started looking to plausibility of MSC grids within the diagnostic concept and which was very interesting and came mostly from Iago's work on Albacore for IOTC. I looked at the diagnostics, including this in those 10 assessments, as I said, and found that they report all five, all four major group of diagnostic tests, the plausibility in a separate category, but all the four major group of diagnostics Overall, all the reports included residual diagnostics, 80% reported retrospective analysis and R0 profile, so thumbs up, and 50% actually included hind casting, which is a fairly new diagnostic. Laurie's paper, I believe, was published first in 2016. Age structure production model and catch curve analysis were only conducted in two out of the 10 um, assessments. So um, as we can see, diagnostics have been used very, very thoroughly to assist with the selection of models as metric for weighting models and symbols and to characterize uncertainty. Um, we find this in the, in the reports. Certain diagnostics can also help us selecting data inputs and better understanding the value of each piece of information in our integrated assessments. A good effect a good effect of implementing diagnostics is that by communicating results from um, the diagnostics to stakeholders and, and other scientists involved in the, in the, in the tuna assessments, which 
um, it's a very um, collaborative process. Most of these assessments are developed through um, working groups and it, 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 it helps to gain confidence and momentum when you're able to clearly provide results on model diagnostics. We can build confidence in people um, direct or not directly involved in the model construction. However, still making decisions based on model diagnostics can get tricky as we don't have clear consensus based on thresholds. What is a good retrospective pattern? What is a bad retrospective pattern? When is too much conflict or not? And so on. But even facing all these challenges, the formal adoption of diagnostics are also on the rise um, in, the, in the tuna uh, world. More and more fishers organizations are recommending the routine use of the tasks during their assessments, including terms of references, um, and even using as the base for accept or reject models, which that is alone open for a, 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 a huge discussion. Here, for example, we have a recommendation from the ICAT stock assessment methods working group. It says, the group recommends um, the SCRS routinely apply objective criteria for model plausibility for all ICAT stock assessments that are intended for management advice. This criteria shall be based on best practice using model diagnostics and go on and on and even um, cites the cookbook and other key uh, sources for model diagnostics. Given this increase in the use of diagnostics and the, and the, and the formal um, recommendations to use um, of them, we could develop, we could think about developing a simple diagnostic-based approach for our tuna stock assessments, in which we could use diagnostics to initially fix models and then eliminate the models that cannot be fixed, as shown in this figure, very straightforward. First, a set of candidate models are chosen based on the assessment author's knowledge and experience. Then diagnostics are applied to each of these models. Those that pass most or all the diagnostics given accepted thresholds go through the final model ensemble. Those that fail are modified as indicated by the diagnostics. This is repeated with the remaining models until no fixes are suggested by um, the diagnostic results. But even a simple approach like this one leads to deeper questions and challenges. For example, how good is the evidence to support action upon diagnostic results? It is very difficult to answer this question. However, we are moving in the right direction um, and to help understand better the limitation and considerations when using model diagnostics to assist with this type of decisions, um, I first recommend watching the talk by Andre on diagnostics yesterday, today, and tomorrow, um, recorded during the CAPM uh, model diagnostics workshop early in early to 22, and is now available on YouTube. Andre gives a very, very good perspective on um, commonly used and, new, and newly developed model diagnostics and how we um, should be careful when using them to make our decisions. And of course, read the report from that same meeting. Um, there is a lot of good information in there and, and, and guidance as well. So as we see model diagnostics being, uh, have been more frequently incorporated across our assessments. And I think it's worth to highlight how they're being used and, and uh, frame into model um, ensembles. Especially in the last year, uh, we also saw an uptake on checking diagnostics across a large range of um, models and how they were used while making decisions on keep it, discard, weight them in an assemble and so on. There were, for example, an impressive work from Phil um, on the Southwest Pacific Blue Shark Assessment and by Max on assessments in, um, um, in Europe. 
but uh, what I wanted to highlight specifically in this talk is the work done by Francesco Manasdi, which I believe is, was the very first one. Um, and Francesco did an incredible job about how to deal with the uncertainty and which models to include in an assemble and how to develop advice. Um, and what, what I think is really special in Francesco um, uh, work is that the whole selection process is really centered around the diagnostic performance. Um, a lot of us might agree or disagree on how they decided to discard or keep the models, but the, the development of the approach alone, it's, a bit, it's, it's very, very interesting. So it, fall, it, it followed the process, uh, followed the major, um, the four major diagnostic groups, convergence, goodness of, goodness of fit, consistency, and prediction skills. And as you can see here, um, they, have, they have a table with 18 different models that perform quite well. Um, however, if you see here, there's, there are three models where the indices fail to pass the agreed prediction skill threshold. Um, and that is really a question that we have to ask ourselves when we are making these decisions based on diagnostics. When you have a benchmark and you agree on an ensemble, should we weight them? And in this case, they decided to downweight the model, those specific model runs in the um, ensemble. So here is the ensemble of the weighted 18 models using the MVLN2 available for stock synthesis, where you can combine um, different model runs um, into one overall model run. Here, I want to show the results from a, a survey as we are talking about um, combining models in an ensemble. I want to show results from a survey conducted during the CAPM workshop uh, on model diagnostics, uh, um, the one that I mentioned early in early 2022. As it was such a great snapshot, a snapshot of our current practices with diagnostics and model ensemble. Um, the survey looked whether or not the diagnostics should be used for including in an ensemble or weighting model runs. You can see here in the results, this was a, and again, it's a good snapshot of our community that more than 60% of the participants are in favor of using results from retrospective analysis, for example, in the um, ensemble process. One interesting result we found is that even that the hind casting diagnostic, which is not used very frequently, was suggested to be used more often. And only 2% of the participants were not supportive of using model diagnostics for awaiting models in an ensemble. So that really shows a shift in the community when in terms of how we are using model diagnostics to put forward um, our base case models or, or, or our ensemble. So what about data diagnostics? Um, and, and this is something that we have been seeing um, coming up in discussions when we, when we uh, present um, the framework of the cookbook. Diagnostics discussed um, in this presentation, what I just provided here and in other presentations that we had in Kaplan uh, over the last year, it, it really focused on feeding stock assessment models to data. One thing that we haven't talked about much in the diagnostic context as a community is the data themselves. Um, it's safe to argue that given the complexity of the data available for the assessments in the tuna RFMOs, we don't spend enough time looking at the structure at the data, right? Uh, for example, here we, we have a snapshot of the, the data um, amount available for the 2022 ICAT South Atlantic Swordfish stock assessment. As you can see, that, that's a, a lot of um, data available for that assessment, um, but we need to spend more time, right? We need to spend more time looking at the structure at the data, more specifically fishery dependent data, where we have very little control from where those data um, came from. As it stated um, in the law of conflicting data, Data is true, 
Um, so before we start getting sophisticated and moving so far away with our analysis on using diagnostics into model selection, ensemble, maybe we need to start looking into these things like um, how were the data collected? Are the data balanced? Are there any outliers that we perhaps need to eliminate? So we really need to think of data more carefully in the context of diagnostics and not wait to deal with that at the modeling development phase. So um, how can we accelerate the use and adoption of model diagnostics in our tuna um, assessments? One way um, is enhancing the transferability of the codes developed for the implementation. The functions for most of the diagnostics we know um, today are available on GitHub. Um, I, I pretty much checked the ones that are commonly used, presenting the cookbook and the imperial selectivity diagnostics and ones that are being more like literally developed in, in, in the last few months. And they're all on GitHub well-documented, which promotes transferability and automation of the diagnostic toolbox across multiple operating systems and stock assessment software. As you can see here, we have pretty much packages for to run diagnostics for stock synthesis uh, at A4A and, and Java and so on. So I believe that we have enough examples out there to support a broader use of diagnostics across RFMOs and even um, find some sort of standardization across the methods that we use. Um, one challenge will be always decide on thresholds um, and how uh, we can interpret them at a stock specific level. So with that, um, Mark, I'm happy to take any questions or save for tomorrow. Mahalo um, Nuiloa. Thank you very much. Thanks, Felipe. We've got a, a little bit of time for questions and we can always ask some more tomorrow. So is, does anyone want to start off with a question for Felipe? Yeah, Charles. Hi. Um, hi, Philippe. Um, it's Charlie Edwards here. Uh, thanks for a great, great talk. Um, not sure if it's a very interesting question, but I'll, I'll give it a go. And it's just um, to do with the, the hierarchy of the diagnostics that you've presented. Obviously, you know, goodness of fit is probably the most important one, but I was wondering if you could make some comments on the most important ones after that, or, or if you use a hierarchy of diagnostics when you're figuring out whether your model is... Um, is usable for your intended purpose, thanks. Yeah, that, that's a great question. Um, it's very hard to find a flow that works for, for all the assessments, right? The hierarchy, what does first and so on. Um, and uh, we, and honestly, because we, we are working, especially me and Henny, we are participating in providing assistance with the the cookbook and SS2 Diags across different um, assessment models, uh, we don't have, we, we, we truly don't have a, like, a, like a common flow that folks used. But personally, um, when we are doing the, 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 the logic assessments, Bill Fish, for example, here in Hawaii, one of the very first diagnoses that I, I am putting forward is the age instructor production model. Um, and this is this comes really from conversations that I remember when myself, Mark and Kevin Piner started discussing this. It's really important to really understand if you can find the fishing effect in your, in your assessment. Um, so having an idea about that process at the beginning of your assessment, um, and if you look at the, at the flow in the cookbook is you start with convergence, right? You, you, you need to get the model converging first, and then you'll start looking at the residuals. Um, but at the very early stages and in the, in the last couple of assessments, even after the publication of the cookbook, I think the age structure production model, um, which was 
highly um, discussed in the in the workshop last year about should it be included as a formal diagnostic or more as a model exploration and, and to understand model behavior. I think it's a very important one to for for us to have an, a, an idea at the beginning of the process. Can can we identify that fish? In fact, can we derive a production function? Um, and the need of recruitment deviations to explain our trends in CPUE and so on. So my comment would be everything else, it, it will comes at a different time, but I think the ASPM, at least for the assessments that I have been involved, I am I'm pushing for start looking to those early and early um, in the development stages. Okay, Felipe, um, I think we'll unless there's a follow-up on that particular question, I think we should uh, break for the day. Do you want to follow up, Charles? Yeah. I just want to say thanks. That's, that's very interesting. The sort of, um, like, I'd, I'd never thought of that, actually, the, the, what, how much you can explain just by looking at the residuals as opposed to, um, yeah, the productivity of the, of the stock per se. So, yeah, thanks very much. Yeah. Okay. So just to add one thing to, to, Felipe's um, statements about that is that um, it depends on what you're using the diagnostics for. If you're using it to f understand and fix the model, then you know all of the diagnostics are probably helpful, so there may not be a, a good hierarchy. Um, if you are just using them to blindly throw models away, then things like convergence and stuff would be first because there's no point in going through all the other complicated diagnostics and then throwing it out later because it didn't converge. So it depends on how you're using them. Okay, well, thanks, Felipe. And I uh, hopefully we'll see you early tomorrow morning for you or something like that. Or was it late? Absolutely, I'll be here. <laughs> and um, tomorrow we'll have Jimmy and Ellie giving a comment on that in a discussion, and then we'll move into model waiting. And uh, finally, an overview presentation by Ray Hilburn and then further discussion. So, and Simon probably has an announcement of the pub today, which is, I can't remember what it's called, but it's, it's recommended by some of my mates, so it must be a good one. Yeah, the Falcon Brewer, which is down, um, I'm not exactly sure where, it's down, down close to the waterfront and uh, further east, I think, um, not too far. It's, Yeah, it's in the email that, that you all got.